Oh, I love it when they clap me. <laughs> oh. Would you like some water? Uh, I'm just going to turn the, this thing off. Silence. That's good. Right, let me just okay. pour you a glass. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this event being sponsored jointly by UK and a Changing Europe and our friends at the European Movement. Uh, our guest tonight, I mean, I've got an introduction to him. I mean, it's Lord Heseltine, Michael Heseltine. You all know him. You all know what a <laughs> proud track record he has in government and in public service. Uh, just a few starters for 10. There should, yeah, there's a QR code on the screen. If you click on that and go to the link, you get to Slido, on which you can post your questions. Now, let me just say, perfectly honestly to start with, I've got so many questions, there is a pretty fair chance I might not get to any of yours in the time that we have. But if you want to take a punt, do so, and you can vote on questions for the ones you think I should be putting to Lord Heseltine, and if time allows, I will. I mean, we've got a lot to go through because you've had such a long and industrious illustrious career and there's, there's several areas I want to touch on. I mean, firstly, your time in government. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about regeneration and levelling up and all those kinds of things. Obviously, I want to talk about EU membership, the referendum, what happens next. And if we get time at the end, I want to get some of your reflections on the state of politics today. <laughs> so, <laughs> a very... It's a very limited agenda we have, but uh, let me, so let me start in the past. Uh, you've said several times, I think, that your relationship with Mrs. Thatcher was misunderstood. What, what did you mean by that? Well, I think probably because I resigned from her government, there was, and survived to rejoin John Major's government, there were those who were her admirers, who saw this as part of a conspiracy of me constantly trying to be difficult to Margaret all the way along. Uh, and then after leaving the government, organizing a sort of conspiracy to get rid of her. Mm. Uh, well, that, that, that's just so far from the truth. Um, I never got on particularly well with Margaret. I, I, I didn't like her personally, but, that, <laughs> no, but that's, that's irrelevant because you don't, you're not in politics with, colleague, with many people to like or dislike. I don't like anyone I work with. So well, you, no, you don't need to. I mean, yeah. it's the difference between friendship and colleagues. But um, so, and Margaret had views of a sort of, uh, within the conservative family, which would be significantly different to mine. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a party like the Conservative Party, you have a huge range of views. And you get together because, as a vehicle to power, you share enough with the rest of your team and to be able to create a coherent government. So my relationship personally with Margaret was perfectly reasonable, although she knew I was much closer to centre than her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose this slightly counters what I'm not going to say. Um, she put me on a list to sack uh, when Peter Walker and Paul Channon and myself were featured in The Economist as people were just about to go. And um, uh, it so happened that I was, the day of this execution, I was actually <laughs> scheduled to speak on behalf of the Conservative opposition, um, uh, opposing a major piece of Labour legislation, and uh, then go on to a meeting of hundreds of small business people with the leader of the party, Margaret. So I was very difficult to sack me then. And then the, the next October, I made one of those party conference speeches, which made me very difficult to sack. And, and so we had to work together, and, and uh, we did. Um, and the important point is that when we came to government in 1979, I was at the forefront of uh, one of the most important of the um, issues of the time, which is the sale of council houses. And um, I also was absolutely at the forefront of the Thatcherite agenda of controlling public expenditure. I got rid of more quangos than even Keith Joseph. Um, 
I reduced my department um, from uh, 52,000 to 39,000 without sacking anybody uh, or making anyone redundant in three years, simply by controlling recruitment. And I introduced management, management uh, techniques for running a government department, all of which Margaret liked the look of and was sympathetic towards. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, most interestingly, when the riots took place in 81, two years into government, Margaret agreed that I would walk the streets of Liverpool to get to find out what the heck had gone wrong, you know. This was perhaps the most interventionist thing that any government ever did, you know. Um, and then she promoted me. What to where? Defence. A, because she thought it was out of control financially, um, and secondly, because the battle for CND, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, was a major feature in the political horizon. So she, she put me there. And it is uh, on the record that um, uh, she told the then chief whip that she thought that I was her natural successor. So it is, the story is nothing like as simple as um, the, the, the supporters of one side or the other have it believed. Uh, it all went wrong over the, um, the, 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 the fate of the Westland Helicopter Company. Yeah. And that all got tied up with the European issue. And I, I resigned from Cabinet, not because of the Westland affair, but because Margaret refused to let me put the case to Cabinet. And um, it's a detailed thing, it's an interesting constitution. My right as a cabinet minister is to be heard by my colleagues. She denied me that right, and I said I can't stay within this government. And I've always uh, hugely regretted, but never doubted for an instant that I could never have lived with, with myself if I had agreed to be silenced uh, and the cabinet never given a chance to listen to my case. We'll, we'll obviously come back to the Europe issue, but I just want to pick up on a couple of things you said. I mean, firstly, on social housing, there are those who date the current housing crisis back to your decision to sell off so much social housing. How would you respond to that? Well, I have a, a total answer uh, because, uh, first of all, I, I'm totally committed to the idea of encouraging home ownership and the mm -hmm. tenants to buy their homes. Um, but the deal I did with the Treasury was that 75% of the cash flow generated by the sale of houses, council houses, would go into the provision of social housing, 75%. And that lasted until I left to be Defence right. Secretary. Uh, and, and of course, that's why we have now such a shortage. So my answer is complete and absolute. I believe that I was not only enfranchising uh, the council tenants, I was providing a huge cash flow for more social housing. Okay, so actually under the terms of your deal, the, it wouldn't have been the mass sell-off that had been a purchase it as well. It would have been a major contributor to social housing. And the other point, I mean, you were talking about uh, conference speeches. I sort of just about remember your conference speeches in the 1970s. And one of the things that made you a darling of the Conservative Party were your attacks on the trade unions back then. Uh, at party conference. When you look at how this government is dealing with the trade unions, what do you make of it? I, I think that not a lot has changed since the Labour Party produced a white paper in 1968 called In Place of Strife. And that confronted the issue, who governs? And the Labour Party, it was Harold Wilson's government, and Barbara Castle was the Secretary of State for Employment, analysed the issue about the power of unions and the use of that power. Um, because, of course, it was not only just the welfare of their members, it was the political uh, uh, agenda of extreme left-wing government. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Ted Heath's election uh, as leader came in 1970 and uh, the same issue f faced his government as faced uh, Harold Wilson's government. But uh, Ted, uh, and this is quite interesting 
social phenomenon, Ted had to try and deal with the issue. Uh, the second prime minister to try and cope. Mm. And uh, Ted, uh, one of his characteristics of him and his generation was his wartime experience. So uh, the men and women who served in the armed forces, and Ted did, had learned the interdependence of people, of classes, of social background. They'd been in it together. I mean, Peter Carrington, for example, mm. commanded a tank. Well, if you're in a tank with a couple of guys from a working class background, you can't sort of see a social division as something that matters. You're all in it together. But that atmosphere was very much present in the period after the war. Mm. And so the, the idea of a confrontation, I mean, at its worst, civil war, uh, was absolutely anathema. Um, and that was all tied up with the treatment and approach of the unions, to the unions. Um, well, we all know the story of the miners, and um, that was a confrontation. Again, the same argument. Ted, if Ted had fought the election on February the 7th in 1974, I think he'd have won. He delayed. Why did he delay? To what extent did Peter Carrington and Willie Whitelaw influence him and confirm him in his desperate anxiety not to have a confrontation of the sort that was discussed? So Ted Weiss lost two weeks, and I fought that election campaign, and I can tell you on February the 7th, the Tories were sweeping the country. It was quite incredible. Right, wherever we went, Good on you, well done, stand up to them, da da da. It was incredible. On the Monday before polling day, it all went dead. Bang. Everybody looked away. And Wilson is reputed to have said, we'll catch them in the last week on prices. And you did. Interesting. <laughs> uh, anyway, so Ted lost and it Labour government. What happened? Another re rerun of the same story the winter of discontent. Probably the worst manifestation of union militancy any government of the post-war world faced. We couldn't bury the dead because the undertakers were on strike. But that was just one of a vast range that destroyed Jim Callaghan's government. But the important point is Ted Heath's government, who'd lost in 74, came back. Different leader, but the same people. And those of us who had fought through all this we knew what had to happen. We had to change the law. We had to establish the fact that in the end there were rules and regulations and the trade unions must abide by them. Um, and so here we are now, a long time. Most of it has been relatively a great improvement in public, in uh, industrial relations. A huge improvement, I would say, in the management of our companies as well. But what have we got now? We've got highly paid consultants on strike. Mm -hmm. We've got junior doctors trying to recoup 35% pay increase. And the, 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 what is it, 100,000 operations put off today? It's, you can't run a country on that basis. But, look, I'm very aware of the danger that I'm quite into this 1970s thing, and I could look at my watch and we could spend the whole hour. I'm going to try not to do that. I'm going to ask you one more question. I'm going to move on to Europe so we do that, and then we can come back to this if we have time. I mean, you said nothing has changed. It strikes me as a strange thing to say. I mean, the unions aren't what they were. Because they I mean, it's were. a very different country now to yeah, what it well, was. Well, they're not what they were because the law of the land was changed, making them, A, behave within the law, uh, but also there were very significant restrictions on, uh, uh, well, a, a major shift from public sector to private sector mm -hmm. uh, on, on the, the denationalization programs. Uh, and the private sector, by and large, is more fragmented and much harder to organize. Mm. And you could argue, uh, debatable, the human resources industry has greatly improved within certainly the private sector. Um, I just think that if you are dealing with huge bureaucracies, very difficult to, uh, um, uh, 
to find a way of avoiding the ability of groups of people to hold the country to ransom. Okay. I'm going to come on to Europe now, because yeah, otherwise I'm going to get too into the 1970s. And in, in your autobiography, you talk about 1973 as being a watershed in British foreign policy uh, when we joined the European Economic Community. What, what made you say that? Why was it such a watershed? Because it recognised uh, that the assumptions of the Second World War had changed. Uh, I, in 1955, went up to Oxford and uh, I helped to create an organisation called the Oxford University Blue Ribbon Club, which was an aspect of the Conservative Association, but European inclined. And the cover was blue, three interwoven circles. America, Europe, and Commonwealth. And that reflected the assumption of not just my new vision, but Commonwealth and America. And if one thinks back about, well, Messina, mm -hmm. 57, why didn't we do it? And the reason we didn't do it was basically that we felt a close affinity to America, what some people call a special relationship, a huge loyalty to Commonwealth and Empire. I mean, incredible. Australia, New Zealand, Canada joined the war the day we, we declared war. And huge numbers of people from Africa and India fought and died for this country on our side. So um, the, the idea of abandoning all that uh, and becoming part of Europe was just inconceivable in 1945. Although Churchill made, of course, one of his most important speeches, we must create a kind of United States of Europe not they must create, we must create a kind of United States. And of course, this was the day, this was the time of Jean Monnet and people like that on the continent who harnessed the feeling of the men and women of the resistance movements and the prisoner of war camps. It must never happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, we were never occupied in this country. And we saw ourselves as, as being different because we were the launch pad of freedom being restored. So, it, 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 well, the best answer to this question I know, and it, 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 it's, it's curious language, but it's very evocative. Michael Charlton um, did a series for the BBC called In Place, in, in, in The Price of Victory. And uh, he interviewed all the people who played a role in government or in the negotiations at the time of the Messina conference. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, the, 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 it's absolutely fascinating and it explains all this in very human terms. But the, to me, the chilling words that I have never forgotten coming out of all that was Rab Butler, who of course was a vitally important part of having created the Conservative, recreated the Conservative Party after the Second World War, uh, was asked about Messina. And he said, it just wasn't on. It wasn't on, you know. Of course, we were quite wrong, but it wasn't on. Now, that language you couldn't hear today, but the language then, it tells you everything. It just wasn't on. We never, you never use those words now. But then it said everything, and it summed up that feeling about reliance on America, that feeling of indebtedness to Commonwealth and Empire, and somehow we were the people who had made all this freedom possible. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't on. But, of course, we were quite wrong. Um, yeah, and in a sense, not being there at the start shaped what happened after we joined, because we joined a club that hadn't been made with our input, didn't we? So it all felt a bit... Well, look... Who ever takes account of anybody outside the membership? Mm. I mean, what's the point 
of joining a club if you're just going to be trying to work out how to look after people who are not members. I mean, so, uh, and, and what, what happened? Well, we, we all know exactly what happened. Basically, the French were very worried about the vast swathe of country to the south, which um, could easily have begun to become depopulated as the people left for the towns. The Germans wanted a bigger market for their industrial products. Deal? Yes. German subsidy to keep the French citizens in the countryside at the common agricultural policy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, if we'd been there, it wouldn't have been the same because we would have had a very different view about the agricultural support system. But we weren't there. And so when the European um, community was then started, it was a deal between France and Germany, mm -hmm. uh, embracing another four countries. Um, and, um, well, you know, that's how it happened. And, of course, you fast forward and, and to, to 1986, I think, um, uh, when Margaret created the single market. Mm -hmm. And what was that all about? We're never going to let the French and Germans do it again because we had complained bitterly about the effects of why we, weren't, why we had to abide by uh, the European rules. Uh, so Margaret, uh, I, I would argue, her single greatest achievement was the single European market. Margaret sent Arthur Cofield to Brussels. He was a tax inspector, a chartered accountant, a former cabinet minister, a very formidable man, he, to negotiate our interests in the single market. And uh, there is no doubt at all that it was, from Britain's point of view, a very significant achievement in our self-interest, but in Europe's self-interest. And, of course, what then, <laughs> it all went wrong, because it was the idea, talking to you here now, the audience listening, wonderful, single market, fantastic. But to the small businessman who was his own finance director, his own marketing director, his own salesman, his own production engineer, sitting, oh my God, I've had a terrible day. Oh, it's another form. A directive turned into a regulation on his desk, f complex, detailed, and another one yesterday and two more tomorrow because the single market needed a myriad of standard harmonization in which you embraced all the European nations' self-interest, but all their rules had to be put into one. And so by the end of the 80s, the feeling of them, Brussels, foreigners, was beginning to penetrate. And the, we have newspapers who are good at exploiting that. Well, that was partly because Margaret Thatcher changed her tone, didn't she? I mean, from she sort of... She changed 90s. her tone because she found that what she'd created was beginning to overwhelm her political uh, right. loyalties. What she created was brilliant. The implementation of it was hard, controversial, essential, and, of course, um, much to our self-interest. So would you agree, then, that... I mean, there was a there was a case in favour to be made, but successive prime ministers, not just her, but actually her successors as well, just failed to go out and make that case. Is that one of the reasons why we ended up where we did? Because prime ministers wouldn't wouldn't talk about the benefits of membership in convincing enough terms. Well, I I think that um, uh, no, I I I think that there was a change between. I think that John Major certainly. I think Tony Blair. Um, uh, and uh, later uh, David Cameron, uh, all explained and, and supported the European um, Union uh, as our, and our membership of it. I think they, we, we did. I certainly have no recollections at all of anything other than maintaining the arguments for the case, although the Euroscepticism was rising. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it, it, it became very difficult with, uh, by the time John Major had come to power um, over Maastricht, for example, which we only won by one vote, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, and, and the Eurosceptics were then very powerful within the Conservative Party. Well, let, me, let me pick you up on Cameron 
at least. You say that he, he made the case. I mean, one of the problems with Cameron, surely, was he'd spent a lot of his time as Prime Minister moaning about the European Union, uh, talking about how he hated going to European councils and would rather be anywhere else. And then all of a sudden, in February 2016, he was saying European integration is vital to our security. And everyone went, hang on. You've just spent six years in government saying, you know, being sniffy about the thing. Are you, yeah, can you no, really I, make I that? think that uh, David um, was a European. His public opinion was in support of Europe by then. In the, that one of the reasons why he did, went for the referendum, because he thought he'd win it. And he, the evidence was that he would win it. Um, and, and that then comes to the whole question of the Brexit campaign and what was it all about and how did it go wrong. Um, but uh, I, I certainly think, I, and I have myself, I have, I, I don't think that the, uh, the, gam the government of, of the, that time fought the Brexit campaign as well as they should, because they talked, they, they did focus groups, and they found that the focus groups were on commerce, business, all these sort of mm -hmm. rather, rather, you know, um, well, they're not sexy po political issues, uh, and so they. But they, they felt that's where they had to go. I think myself, what was missing in that cam campaign was the vision that led to the European Union in the first place. Yeah. Their vision or our vision, in the sense, you know, the vision of Messina or the vision of. Yeah, well, the, the the vision that that drove the European movement was missing in the referendum, the bre Brexit referendum. But isn't part of the problem with that argument that you would have needed successive prime, you know, that that view would have had to be inculcated prior to the referendum? You couldn't suddenly start talking about the European Union. No, but you, you've missed the point. We were already, we were going to win the referendum. Public opinion was already in favour of Europe mm -hmm. at the beginning. It was the campaign that upturned it over. So you have to look at the campaign. And, and remember, the lead up to the Brexit referendum uh, had been a very difficult period post-2008 mm -hmm. when the, the world financial crisis took place. And people's living standards had uh, basically remained static up to the referendum. And so there, there, although on strict polling, Europe was in the lead, but in people's uh, feeling there was a need for change. And of course, what the Brexiteers did was to take the need for change mm -hmm. and turn it into anti-Brexit. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, the government was not as articulate, in my view, as it should have been in trying to separate the vision of Europe from the economic consequences of 2008. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, the other thing from memory that was missing from that campaign was you, in the sense that, you know, just thinking back and having you sitting here now, it dawns on me that the Remain campaign could possibly have mobilised Tarzan to go out there and... Well, I'll tell you why that happened. And um, uh, forgive me, it's rather an arrogant um, story, but it happens to be the truth. At the very beginning of that campaign, uh, there, were, there was a, 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 I think it was a dinner, but it was a meeting, probably not much, around this size, all party. And uh, I uh, was asked to speak at it, and I did. And one after the other, people came up to me and said, we've never heard that before. We've never heard it put like that before. You know, you've got to play a big role. And that was the last time I had any official involvement in the campaign. Now, I did appear with, on programmes and meetings, but never with the sort of full flair and panache the of, the, of the campaign. You no, know, that's right. And after the um, thing was over, I talked to a senior official in number 10, and I said, you remember that meeting when you, I had quite a success? Why did I never hear from anyone again? He said, because you had appeared on a platform with Ken Clark, I think, and Tony Blair in where the Euro was being discussed. And the organizers of the campaign <coughs> were frightened that if they used you, 
the conduct of the campaign would all be about the euro, and you, in me, I would say something that was not 100% black and white, um, uh, and that would lose us to the referendum. So that's why I was never used. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I think quite wrongly, I have to say, because I think... <laughs> I, I think... I, 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 I think... If you do say so yourself. I, I did, well, I, did, I didn't... I mean, I, nothing I could do about it. I mean, they didn't want to use me. They didn't want to use me. But uh, I think that... Um, I think I could have put a, 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 a perspective into that campaign, which... Well, it became a very emotional campaign. And... I mean, a, a morally bankrupt campaign, but uh, um, uh, very emotional. And um, the side of the case that I understand is one of emotion. It's not, I, I know the economic and factual arguments as well, but uh, it's the vision. It is a thousand years of bloodshed in which polit politicians who failed send the younger generation to die. That's what Europe is about. And we have found a solution where we talk. Yes, it's boring. Yes, they're bureaucrats. Yes, you have to sit there and listen to people banging on. But we don't send generations of young people to die. But there was another... <laughs> I mean, there, there was another vision, wasn't there, which was a thousand years of British history, the Gateskill line. You know, well, why would we throw that a away? Thousand and that... Year, a thousand years of British history. What was it? One battle after another of the Europeans. <laughs> OK. We, we, were in, we were up to here in it. When, when you say the campaign was morally bankrupt, what do you mean? Well, I'll tell you what the campaign was really about. Let's not muck about, you know. The campaign was about time for change because of the 2008 campaign. They wanted change. And so someone has to... If, if this change, it's not your fault or yours or mine or yours, you've got to find someone else, haven't you? Someone else that rings bells, strikes chords, rises the temperature. Well, we all know who does that. They, them, it, Europe, officials. And one more? Res. And the underlying drive of Brexit was immigration. And was it 40 million Turks who are going to be allowed? 70. 70 million. I think it was 70 million. 70 million. What's, what's 10 million here or there? <laughs> 70 million Turks. What was that all about? Mm -hmm. Race, immigration. Mm -hmm. And that was led by people like Nigel Farage, exploited by Boris Johnson. That was the driver that tipped just, just by the narrowest of margins. The British people over. Now, I, I lived through Enoch Powell's speech. I was the first Conservative to criticise him in 1968. Mm -hmm. I saw what race can do as an issue in this country, in any country. Look across the world today, it is disastrous that racial conflicts everywhere, racialism, tribalism, you know, just look around the world, it's everywhere. And so anyone in politics who knows about communication knows that if you want to stir things unforgivably, that's the place to go. And why Enoch's speech was immoral is because not only did it do it in spades with language which was inflammatory, there was not a shred of a sensible suggestion of what to do about it. So he stirred up the docker, the meat porters of Smithfield Marks, my constituents could hardly talk with they were so carried away. And, of course, Ted sacked him, quite rightly. But, uh, uh, that, you know, so I've lived through these manifestations uh, of Brexit and immigration and all that twice. But you only have to go back to the 1930s to find some pretty chilling examples. OK, well, let me just challenge you on that a little bit, because what we've seen since the referendum... I mean, paradoxically enough, is we've seen a massive increase in immigration from non-white countries. Yes. Uh, Nigeria, India, places yes. like that. Yes. 
And simultaneously, we've seen a softening of public attitudes towards immigration, which kind of belies your argument, doesn't it? So immigration of non-white people has gone up massively. Public opinion has softened. So how does your argument make sense? Well, I can only tell you, I'm, I know what the situation was like in the referendum, mm -hmm. and that was the issue at the time. Uh, I have the slightest doubt that it was the, 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 the tripping point. Now, you're quite right today, but, but equally, you know, uh, you say public opinion has softened. Well, has the voice of parts of the British media softened? No, but... But you see, we've got to remember, if only 1% they won by, a huge proportion of the population weren't fooled by any of this. There were only sections. And the Red Wall, has attitudes changed there? Yes. Well, why do you think that neither of the big parties will talk about um, uh, immigrate, uh, no, Brexit? OK, we'll, we'll, we'll come, we're, we're sort of, that's, that's for the few. We will come back onto that, I promise you. But just, just sort of on this immigration point, I suppose what some of the levers in the Conservative Party would say to you is it wasn't about race, it wasn't even about numbers, it was about control. And actually what public opinion post-referendum shows us is that that is what resonates with, with public opinion. The fact that we now get to choose who comes in with work visas and we no longer have freedom of movement. No. I don't buy that. <laughs> I'm sensing that. Um, oh, that you're, you're, you're quite right to show that uh, um, uh, the immigration figures now, I, I think I'm right, you will know, are higher than we've ever had them. So the idea that there was control uh, was just part of the, the, the dialogue. Um, it sounded good. Mm -hmm. The fact you couldn't do it, well, you know. So I think um, I'm the first to say I think this country is probably the best example in the world of a tolerance of a civilized society. I think it probably is. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that everybody subscribes to that view. And I think the problem with the Red Wall, which is where it is perceived the balance of politics lies in the forthcoming election. Misleadingly. What? Misleadingly. Uh, no, because there aren't that many seats there, are there? Uh, well, there were, there were quite enough, quite a few, quite a few. Um, and uh, uh, you may be right, but, but certainly uh, the perception in, in uh, to the two main parties is that if you stir up Brexit and you stir up the Red Wall, and I think that uh, uh, that, that but, but the, the, the problem is rather interesting, really, because suddenly everybody's talking about parts of. Europe, the Horizon program, self-evidently, Northern Ireland, Macron's statement uh, and um, um, Starmer's response. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, none of this has stirred up the Red Wall. But the issue is immigration. And the one thing, and the thing that really reinforces all of this is the, boat, the boats which um, uh, where patently we've lost control. Uh, and my own view is clear. The only way we'll ever get control is on a pan-European basis. Uh, and uh, I think one needs to recognize uh, that the frontiers of Europe are where the controls will need to be exercised. Because Europe is a honeypot. I mean, what? I've given up with these questions, I have to be honest. What, <laughs> what about the way that the EU is handling immigration at the moment makes you think that a pan-European solution is the answer? Because actually... No, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. It's very worrying. You see, it's, it's, but it's the same issue, isn't no, it? No, it is the same issue. It's, I mean, it's on a far smaller scale here, it's worth saying. Uh, than it is well, it's, than it's, but it, across Europe, you can see the rise of the right. And the reason that the right is rising as it always was, mm -hmm. basically immigration. And economy. And, yes, but 
Yes, there's always been economics, you're quite right, but, but it's, when they, it's when they find who's responsible. When you're looking for someone to blame, yeah. then race is never far from the irresponsible right wing. Okay, I want to circle back, because I'm not going to let you off the hook, because I want to talk a little bit about your party in the years 2016 to 2020. Uh, and Brexit. I mean, what happened, I suppose, is, you know, seen through your eyes as you watch the Conservative Party do the things it did in that period and sign the sort of... What, I mean, what did you... I mean, you did our podcast, I think, in 2018, and I suppose the summary would be you were totally appalled. But I, I, looking I back do, now... I do podcasts every day. It's good. <laughs> yeah, but ours is the one you remember. It's, uh, absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> they never stop. <laughs> um, anyway... Um, where were we? What happened to the Conservative Party? Well, you have to, at the heart of it is Europe. That the Brexiteers, the, the anti-Europeans, became more and more powerful. They, of the leaders of the Conservative Party, there were three, um, Michael Howard, um, Ian Duncan Smith, and um, um, Lord Hague. Um, from the Eurosceptic side of the party. They didn't make progress. Uh, the Conservative Party did what it always does, reverted to the centre with David Cameron. And David Cameron, in my view, led a sensible government um, in hugely difficult circumstances because of the 2008 crisis, which went on and on. But if I... Uh, I think David, I think he made, he made a mistake in um, Just one. giving a gesture to the Eurosceptics when he said he would leave the European People's Party. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's, there's a famous saying, you'll all know it, once you've paid the Dane girls, uh, you'll never get rid of the Dane. And so that, they saw that as, you know, we can get this, we can get this. And in the end, he felt that he thought he could win. And so he thought he could lance the boil. Um, and, and that turned out to be wrong. And that's when Boris Johnson uh, arrives on the scene. I think Ken Clark had a great line, which was something like, feeding buns to the crocodiles is fine until you run out of buns. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Well, couple that with mine Danes and Dane girls, and, <laughs> and you've got it all set out. Yes. 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 No, I mean, I, I, that's as you'd expect with Ken. It was very eloquent. <laughs> now, has, do you, watching Rishi Sunak bring about a very slow, halting, tentative rapprochement with the European Union? You know, if you think about the Windsor framework, you think about Horizon, very, very slow, small, very, very small steps. Do you, does it make you hopeful that we're moving in the right direction? Yes. No, we will, we will move in the pro-European direction. You know, what is it, 68% of the population now think Brexit is a mistake, or is it 61? It's a huge proportion mm -hmm. now know that it's a mistake. And uh, as time goes on, and as the age profile of the electorate changes, uh, the younger generation become a larger proportion, then it will change more. And as experience, um, uh, just of the loneliness of being outside and the futility of the things that were promised, you know, all these wonderful deals we were going to do all over the world, uh, and where are they, you know, and were they wonderful, uh, you know? I mean, I, I have a company which I started many years ago, and I, I, I was talking to the chief executive. We employ about one and a half thousand people. About half of them here, uh, 500 in America, 50 in Germany, 200 in India, um, 100 in Hong Kong. This month, we've bought a company in Canada and a company in Holland. And so none of that has been affected by Brexit at all. And what strikes me is that if I was a manufacturer and I opened up a bigger market 
in Asia somewhere for my products, whatever they were, someone would tap me on the shoulder and say, why do you pay English salary rates when you can assemble your plants here in Asia at much cheaper wage rates? Uh, if you're a service industry, which I am, my company is, if you start in all these countries which we're in, you employ local people. Mm -hmm. You don't send a lot of expats out there. You know, in Hong Kong, we employ a lot of Chinese guys. And uh, so I can't, I never could see what these fantastic deals were going to compensate for severing our relationship with someone 21 miles over the water. And, and so it was all just words, um, uh, and largely words designed to appeal who perhaps didn't have quite as much experience of international trade or, in my case, international politics uh, uh, and the reality of what we're up against in the world. I mean, you seem very confident about this, but I mean, you know, alongside the 60 odd percent who think Brexit was a mistake, the other phenomenon in public opinion is that fewer and fewer people really care about it. I mean, the figure now is, I think, seven, eight percent, yeah. and no, down quite significantly in the last year. And this is the point I made earlier. They didn't care about Europe. They cared about immigration. No, but what I'm saying is, in order to make this, if, if you're a political leader now that wants to make this an issue, one of the constraints you'll face is that the public will think, you know, why, why are you focusing on this? Well, that may well be, but if you can diffuse the issue, um, then there won't be such resistance. And people who have to make the decisions, as I have had to do on various occasions in government, mm -hmm will be able to get ahead and do it without any aggro. So I, mean, I created the European Space Agency in 1973, I think it was. There was no fuss, except there was murmurings in Whitehall because they didn't want to see, Margaret didn't want the post office space activities handed over to the Europeans. The Ministry of Defence said it would desire the special relationship, but they left me free to go and create a relationship with Europe in which we all um, shared common programs. Uh, uh, but it, it's, it, if I give you the background to that, it tells you all you need to know about why we'll go back into Europe. Minister, would you be kind enough to sign this document here? It's just six million pounds to give to a British space company because you know those French and Germans have been subsidizing their industry and we're getting a bit behind. Just sign here. I said, well, before I actually spend six million pounds, tell me just one question. How much does Britain spend on space, how much does Europe combined spend on space, and how much does America spend on space? The British figure I forget, the European figure was 200 million pounds. The American figure was 1.2 billion pounds. Mm -hmm. And so I said to officials, this is toy town, isn't it? You're, you're asking me to try and compete with the French and the Germans, why don't we put ourselves together and use that 200 million comprehensively? If I go for fast forward, Minister of Defence in 1984, General Abrahamson came to see me. He was Ronald Reagan's choice to mastermind the Strategic Defence Initiative. Strategic Defence Initiative was a screen an electronic screen that prevented missiles penetrating your airspace. The Secretary said, I've got a budget of $29 billion. Just, just get that figure. $29 billion to execute this program. And Minister, I can spend $100 million today in Harriet Watt University, where they are at the leading edge of this or that technology. I heard him say, I have $29 billion and I know where the leading edge of technology is in any part of the world and I'm going to make partnerships with all of them. 
I didn't hear him say, and that will take all the technology back into Silicon Valley, just as the American Space and Defense Program has created Silicon Valley. And that's why I'm a European. OK. I mean, uh, your, your, your faith in sort of economic rationality to dominate politics is touching. But I mean, over, you know, if you, surely the last sort of six or seven years have taught us that that sort of logic doesn't always triumph. So I'll tell you what, can you sketch for me what you think will happen over the next 10 years in terms of our relationship yes. with the European Union? Do you yes. think we'll go back in in that time frame? Yes. How, how uh, well, I'll tell you why, why I, think. I, I think. I think what will happen is what's already happening. You see, the, the Brexit case is, is disintegrating. Um, today, there's no one who believes that Brexit's been a success. The only people left with the Brexit stain on their conscience is those who say, we never had a chance to do it properly. <laughs> you know, the, the fact they've been in power for six years and they've had the levers of power in the hands of Brexiteers from the day that Boris Johnson and uh, um, Liam Fox and David Davis became the Brexiteer champions in the new government. They have had their hands on the levers of power. And actually, they, what have they got to show for it? Virtually nothing. And so now they say, well, we, we were never given a chance. It's complete, I mean, absolutely unbelievable rubbish. But that's the truth of it. And that, that will gradually permeate through society, particularly as more and more people become involved in, the, in the European activities. Horizon already, uh, the um, Erasmus programme possibly, the veterinary demon, but a whole range of other areas. And then people will realise, but the rules are being made by someone else. And then a, a politician will be brave enough to stand in this country and say, we're bigger than that. They're, we should be helping with these rules. Now, I can't tell you what the crisis will be, whether it will be environmental, climate change, tax, taxation, avoidance, whatever it may be. But there are massive issues out there on the global stage mm -hmm. when Europe is more equipped. Uh, immigration is, is one. Because how are you going to stop the boat people? I mean, one of the questions the Brexiteers can't answer, suppose it was the other way around, and it was from our country that the, rep the immigrants were going to France. J just, just imagine if the French turned around and said, you've taken back. Yeah. I mean, what do you think the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph would say about that? <laughs> you know? um, so uh, the, the events are going to go, are already going our way. But the interesting thing is, and I repeat this, it is immigration that is the issue, not the European rules or whatever. I'll give you another example. But what changes that then in a debate about, I mean, you know... Experience. The experience of showing that when you join the Horizon programme, not a hair of head was upset. The no, red you... wall did not revolt. No, but when you join the single market, it's a whole different kettle of fish, isn't it? Because there's... Yes, because all sorts of companies will be saying we'll be able to get the export to there more effectively, et cetera, et cetera. And freedom of movement. Uh, that will have to be discussed, because it, right. it may be, yes. But then you've got the outer ring, you've got Macron, and the new starting point, you see. So that's, I mean, the, 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 I think it's quite... What Macron has said is very interesting. And you're quite right, you do, you do come up against this question of who makes the rules. That's quite right. But, but, but I mean, by sheer serendipity, you've answered a few of the questions there without me putting them to you, so that's good. But on, on Macron and these concerns, I mean, one of the interesting things about just how badly we in the UK misinterpreted yesterday's papers is half the authors have come out today on social media and said, actually, this associate status was never going to work for the UK because the UK won't accept single market membership because single market membership is indivisible. So I don't understand how you see that. We still have that hurdle of immigration that you spoke about so eloquently half an hour ago. That is a debate. It is hard to see a politician wanting to have, isn't it? No, not when a lot of people uh, have realised that there is an opportunity to improve our trade 
and who knows what other things may be on the agenda in the climate change debate and all that sort of thing. And when public opinion has um, realized that the, being part of Europe is not a part of the racial immigrant issue, although, although it could be, and in my view should be, because I think we should, I think we need a martial aid program in which Europe defends its frontier, uh, which will be hard but necessary, but it coordinates its aid programs in order to stimulate wealth creating opportunities in the countries from which people come. But what, 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 one, what one has to realize, and, and it, it's, it's um, this is the, the, the problem, that everywhere in the world, in the most impoverished parts of the world, someone has got one of these. And they know how we live. They see the standards of living. They see what it's like. And if you're a 26-year-old guy with a wife and a young family, it'd be nice to share a bit of that. These are not people with their feet up, idlers, shirkers, whatever it is. These are the energetic, entrepreneurial, I want to get a better deal for my family. In the language of someone I won't refer to, they got on their bikes. <laughs> I, do you think, what do you make of Keir Starmer's approach to the European Union? Well, uh, it, it, look, uh, it's not my job to advise leaders of the Labour Party. <laughs> but, but give it a go. Yeah, no, well, I, well, I, I will give you a historic uh, uh, word of advice. If you're in opposition, never have a policy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, absolutely never have a policy, because your job is to oppose. And whenever something goes wrong, you want to hammer the other guy. And when he's on the ground, you kick him, you know. Um, so so um, if you have a policy in opposition, if it's any good, the government will immediately <laughs> embrace it. And it will be long forgotten that you ever originated it. If it's a bad one, well, then you've got headlines in every right-wing newspaper in the country. You'll never talk about anything else. So, uh, and you can see that's happening now, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, day after day, it's fascinating just seeing the, 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 the mechanics of politics. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, anyway, the, um, the, the, the um, uh, so Keir Starmer is coming under more pressure as the election gets closer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's beginning to open up a bit. And of course, the, the counterattacks yeah. are, are becoming more targeted. That's why don't, we never want to have policies. Is it, is it your sense, though, that if he became prime minister, he would take us back closer to the European Union than if the Conservatives continued in power now? No, I think Conservatives will do it as well. <laughs> See, the Conservative Party is the most successful political party in the, human, in the history of democracy. Uh, why? because it is essentially a coalition in pursuit of power. And to achieve power, you have to appeal to a large number of people, embracing a whole horizon of opinions. And the Conservative Party is brilliant at realigning itself, readjusting itself, regrouping to achieve power. But you missed a bit, didn't you? I mean, it's a coalition in search of power whose leader is chosen by a massively unrepresentative well, tiny segment of the population. That's a mistake, but that's... that's, but that's where we are, isn't yes, it? Yes, but that's uncharacteristic of the Conservative. But, 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 you're quite right, and this is, a, will make it harder, unless, of course, the Conservatives in the House of Commons change the rules, mm -hmm. which they'd be perfectly capable of doing, uh, and would, and should. Um, but equally, the Conservative Party is made up of, as I said, a broad horizon, but I know huge numbers of its activist members, and they're very practical people. They may well have moved to the right, but if they think they're going to lose, they'll move back to where they can win. And it'll take, a, it'll take they'll follow a leader. The Conservatives are very, very much orientated. And David Cameron 
you think about the sort of things that David talked about, go love a hoodie, you know, and, and they, lo they loved it. Um, and David did things which, um, uh, in, in appealing to certain groups that would not be natural allies of the Conservative Party, but he won an election, and they like that. So I tell you that, although you're quite right, the, 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 the leadership change is not the best thing that's happened, it could be undone, but even if it isn't undone, I have a working knowledge of those people, and in the end they want to win. So, just to be straight, imagine Keir Starmer wins the next election. Do I have to? <laughs> just try. Check your eyes. And imagine that the Conservatives have a leadership election straight afterwards, just hypothetically. Isn't the probability that they will get a far more pro-Brexit Prime Minister or leader? Pro-Brexit? Right, pro-Brexit leader. Isn't, isn't the, 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 the dynamic of the membership that they will go in that direction. What, right wing? Yeah, well... No, no, well, no, they won't. Okay. No, no, they wouldn't. That's the last one. They, this is not what the Tory party does. The Tory party regroups for power. Okay. Just, I mean, on the Conservative Party, and you, you spent a lot of time talking about the Red Wall. I mean... Well, I'm not sure how to... Who are the Conservatives for, I suppose, is my question. I mean, who is the Conservative core voter, because it seems to me that the party has a problem now, that they have lots of different sorts of votes. I mean, Boris Johnson put together a coalition. What is it? The Tory party gets 13 million votes or something like that. How do you identify the core of 13 million? Well, let me give you a practical example, OK, uh, which is Rishi Sunak today, uh, changing the deadline for getting rid of combustion engines, OK? Well, now, wait, let's get one, carried away. He's put it back five yeah, years. Yeah, he's put it back. But what, one logic is that this is to appeal to a certain sort of conservative. It's almost as if we appeal to those red wall voters who might be slightly more worried about this than others. But isn't he appealing to the wrong audience? Isn't the Conservative Party is a? See, I don't think that is that. that it isn't that program is not for the red wall voters. It was Uxbridge that generated that. Okay, but it, and that was very much not red wall. No, yeah. but. The people who are likely to not like it are the sort of liberal-leaning, blue-wall Tory voters who might flee to the Lib Dems, aren't they? Yeah, there, will, there will be a, a price to pay uh, in what you call the, the could be the, the green south of England. Mm -hmm. That is true. But, but if, as I suspect, we, we will hear a whole range of figures as to what it's going to cost people to implement the um, uh, uh, um, uh, to buy electric vehicles. The, the, yes, the yeah. agenda. Um, I mean, I just I heard a newscast that was coming up. Uh, it was very very brief, of course, but there was references to ten thousand pounds a family and that sort of thing. Now I don't know what it's all about, but 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 there will be figures, believe me, as to how, and the, the, you know in Brec in Uxbridge it was twelve pounds a day to take your car into London. And, and when you, when that, that is the language which has a certain sort of, uh, it's quite easy to understand. <laughs> uh, so we'll see what, the, what uh, but that's not red wall. Red wall is a different issue. Red wall, you haven't asked me about. So that, it's, uh, uh, this is what I used to do when I used to go on the Today program. If I, if I, it, it, I always had my answers ready. And uh, if they didn't ask me the question, I would say, you haven't asked me the right question yet. <laughs> so, then I, so here I am on devolution. But that is about the Red Wall. And, and the devolution agenda, which David Cameron did a lot. I had a whole section on devolution, but I kind of... Well, I was helping you. I was just helping you. Know, because the, 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 that is what the, the, a, a conservative government should be doing, is devolution. Because this country is not well managed. And uh, it is too central in London, it is too functionally divided, mm -hmm. and there is too little reliance on the spontaneity of the locality and the local different economies that exist. They're all different. Manchester is not Liverpool, Liverpool is not Leeds, Leeds is not um, uh, London. They all, these great economies which make up our country all have different strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. And they, uh, the, what, what we should be doing is to have mayoral authorities in some 60 authorities all devising their strategy locally mm -hmm. and a central government working in partnership to, to help them achieve it.
But also, presumably, di not just devolving political authority, but devolving budgetary power yeah, to that. I mean, that's the problem, isn't yeah, it? Is of course, it? of course. Do that's you think the Metro Mays are a, a useful step in the right direction? Oh, yes. I mean, that was David Cameron. And that was, uh, I had the privilege of being a special advisor to um, uh, Greg Clark and uh, uh, therefore uh, George Osborne when we did it. And that, that you know, it, all of this was looked at by Redcliffe Maud in 1968. Yeah. And that's, that is, that's the last serious analysis of how you should run this country effectively. And uh, I was, there were 1,300 authorities then, and Redcliffe Maud said we needed 60. Well, I was a junior minister in the government that uh, got it down to 300, and there are about 300 today. And we don't need 300, we need 60. Yeah. And uh, we need directly elected mayors so that the, there's a comprehensive accountability across the whole area as opposed to a party you know you can have a Labour Party who, who won we'll say 55 council seats out of 100 and they don't need to worry about the 45 and the same is true of the Conservative Party they win 55 councillors they don't need to worry about the problems of the 45 um, uh, but if you want to get to stimulate an economy you have to draw together the strengths of the public and the private sector. You have to embrace the academics, the universities, the, the education people, uh, the, uh, the, the quangos, which are all independent now mm -hmm. um, and, and are not in any legalistic way bound to take an interest collectively. Uh, and of course, the huge private sector. And, and these, the, uh, an elected mayor, it, it, which is the international model, an elected mayor can draw these together and create a partnership and a fusion of local strengths. I was struck by what you said about numbers of council. Are you, are you a proponent of proportional representation for our electoral system? No, I'm just talking about the facts of the matter. No, but I just wondered whether yeah. no, I, those arguments had convinced I, you that... Uh, uh, the, 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 the PR system would destroy the Labour Party and the Tory Party. Mm -hmm. That's what it would do. And so it would take some persuading for me to... No one seems very unhappy about this, to be honest. I mean. no, but but I, I would need to be persuaded we'd get something better. You see? That's, that's it. So it's, it's like them. Oh, yes, PR. Have PR. We'll, that'll be wonderful. You, you, I, I would take some persuading that uh, it would be wonderful. It might just slow things all up. Everything becomes a compromise. But isn't one argument that's, that precisely because everything becomes a compromise, the parties would have to talk to each other and you wouldn't end up with a system where the new lot comes in and as a matter of principle scraps everything the old lot did, which means that policy is very haphazard, no long-term policy planning no, is possible. It's worse than you're saying. Oh, good. Yeah, it's worse. Why? Well, I was president of the Board of Trade and I think I was the 13th in 11 years. Yeah. So it's not, a, it's not about one government changing for another. It's about one minister changing from another. And, and it, how on earth can you have a serious strategy if the, the tenure of ministers... I mean, I, I did three years in, I think, every job I had. Um, uh, but that's very exceptional. And that's an important part of it. And the, another important part of it, of course, is that a very significant number of politicians don't have any specialist knowledge or interest in the subject to which they're appointed. And, and I don't know how you cope with that. It's very difficult to, you know, um, because the House of Commons is not going to be full of technocrats, and it shouldn't be full of technocrats. Um, but it takes, it, 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 you've got all the problems of balancing the party interests and looking after the whips recommendations and the ge ge geographic representation issues, all have to be balanced in a, in a team of 80 people chosen from 300 people. Mm. So you've got 80 ministers and you haven't got, you've not, not the widest constituency to choose from, <laughs> but you have I mean, to do it. Which prompts me to, we're about to run out of time, but it does prompt me to ask you one last question, which is an invitation to, I suppose, look at the past through rose tinted spe spectacles. If you think about the political figures that you were in parliament with, you know, you're Barbara Castles, your Tony Benz, real giants. Do you think the calibre of politicians <laughs> is as high these days? 
I'm often asked that question. And uh, really I, how disappointing. I, 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 um, I find it very difficult to answer because I, I'm one, I have one very real experience that when I left Margaret's government in 1986, you had Quentin Hailsham, Peter Carrington, mm -hmm. Willie Whitelaw, a range of... I mean, these guys had fought in the Second World War. I mean, they were real giant figures, you know, old enough, I suppose, to be at least my father. Um, and um, then I went back in 1990, mm -hmm. and they were... 20 years younger than me. And you can't see giants down the generation. You see giants up the generation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, where is the Churchill of today? You know, uh, I can't see such a phenomenon. But events made him, if you think about it, I mean, his, his pre-war record was a pretty... We have an interesting debate about that. But, I mean, what he did in the war is phenomenal. But wonderful, wonderful description. A friend of mine got into the House of Commons in 1959, and he said that when Churchill went through the division lobbies, everybody stood back and watched history walk past. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Yeah, that's a nice yeah. phrase. Lord Heseltine, Michael... I mean, it amazes me to say this, but we've reached the end of our allotted time. I could have kept going for ages because I've got, I want to go back to the 1970s and talk about that, to be perfectly honest. However, let me just take this opportunity to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's been utterly fascinating. We really, it. Good. It. we really enjoyed it too. Thank, thank you. you.